imagine being arrested for drug possession and sentenced to life in a Turkish prison. This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my special guest is the one and only Billy Hayes. We're going to talk about Midnight Express, his award-winning book and movie. It all starts right here, right now on Guys Guys TV. You can also catch me on KCAA Radio in Southern California and Guys Guys Radio, my worldwide podcast. Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio, thanks for your support. Okay, today we're going to discuss what's known as the Midnight Express, which is an escape from prison with one of the most famous escapees in our culture. His name is Billy Hayes. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Since publishing his best-selling work, Midnight Express, Billy has had an extensive career as an actor, director, screenwriter, and public speaker. His second book, Midnight Return, explores the, his life after prison and the parallel lives of those he left behind. Completing that trilogy in 19, excuse me, in 2013, Billy published Midnight Express Letters from a Turkish Prison, 1917 to 75. He's got a new book out. It's called Midnight Express Epilogue Train Keeps Rolling. He has an extensive career in Hollywood as an actor, writer, director, does some theater work, one man show. He's really an amazing guy. And I'm so thrilled he's joining us today on Guys Guys Radio. So welcome, Billy Hayes, to the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So let's start at the very beginning. Did you ever think when you were arrested in the Turkish prison that you and ended up in a Turkish prison that you were beginning a lifelong journey of self-discovery and a long creative career? I didn't back then. No, all I thought about is that the world has just collapsed. The sky fell on my head. And, you know, after having run around from 1969, 1970, I smuggled three times successfully from Istanbul to New York. So I knew I was golden, invincible, and nothing could touch me. That's how stupid I was. And then on the fourth trip, I was arrested and uh, the sky fell on my head. And I realized not only have I just completely fucked up my own life, but I've just put all the people who love me in prison. And that actually became the most difficult part of jail is knowing that my mom went to sleep every night with pain in her heart. Anyway, I, I was originally sentenced to four years and two months, which seemed, seemed like forever to me. And I was constantly trying to escape. I had a variety of plans that I was working on. And one of the plans included going to a madhouse and having my best friend in the world come to help me and help me get out. And in the process of doing that, he was uh, murdered in a hotel room. All right, all right hang on, hang on. Let's. I want to start again because I'm going to get to all of that, but I want to just get some context at the beginning. And you can't say fuck, okay? Oh, all right. All right. So let's just start over. Let me just mark this at the. Uh... No, no worries, though, okay? No, all right. Okay. All right. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh... Okay, ready, go. Billy Hayes, since publishing his best-selling book, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes, my special guest today, has led an extensive career as an actor, director, screenwriter, public speaker. We're gonna talk with Billy today about the Midnight Express, which is really escaping prison, his time in prison, what he learned there, his extensive career afterwards. He, written, he wrote a bestseller book upon his escape called Midnight Express. He wrote Midnight Return, explored his life after prison and some of the lives that were left behind. And then he did a trilogy book, the third book, Midnight Express, Letters from a Turkish Prison. And now we're going to talk about his fourth book, which is called Midnight Express Epilogue, Train Keeps Running. He's also done one-man plays. He's directed. He's been in TV shows and films. He's just had a really interesting career. He's an interesting guy. First time on Guys Guys Radio. So welcome to the show. Billy Hayes, welcome to Guys Guys Radio. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for having me. So I think everybody's familiar with your uh, being busted at the Turkish airport with a couple of kilos of hash and marijuana strapped to you, and then your time in prison, your famous escape, and everything that came after that in our culture. But what were you doing kind of beforehand? Uh, well, you mentioned to me kind of offline that you had done a couple of trips to Turkey before. So what was your life like, and why were you going to Turkey, and why were you smuggling hashish? <laughs> uh, I was actually, I was the Marquette University Journalism School. I, uh, I admired Jack London. He was my hero. I wanted to write books about adventurous tales. 
And I ended up traveling to Istanbul. A friend of mine had come back from there and he picked up a little bit of hash that he kept in his money belt and we smoked it. It was incredibly good. And he said, it's cheap. It's easy. They sell it right on the street. And I was working, at, I was still at Marquette. I had a part-time job at the local hospital working with disturbed kids. Strangely enough, I met a nurse who liked me and I said, I'd like, I'd like to get a job this summer. And she said, I work with disturbed children. You know, you have no history in that. I said, I know, but I'm just good with kids. And she said, really? And the next day I was at the hospital and I, I worked for several months with these actually very disturbed autistic kids on a locked ward a little precursor of what was to come. And while I was there, a friend of mine came back to stumble with this little chunk of hash. He said, it's good. They sell it on the street, which was in my mind. And one night I took a break from working with the kids and I would get off the locked ward and just walk around the hospital just to clear my head. Emotionally, I wasn't ready for this job. I mean, I wanted to cure all these kids and heal them. That doesn't happen. And as I walked past one room, I saw a doctor dipping a roll of plaster of Paris tape into water and wrapping it around a patient's broken leg. This is the cast room. And an idea came to me <laughs> that changed my life. And um, two weeks later, I was in Istanbul with some money that my friends had put together. And I had several rolls of those plaster Paris bandages in my bag. And uh, it took me about two weeks to get past a couple of ripoffs and one guy with a gun, but one thing led to another. And I now have two kilos of hashish that I taped to my leg and then dipped the roll of plaster tape into water, wrapped it around my leg until this beautiful white cast formed. And I spent an interesting night smoking hash and watching the, the, the cast dry. And next day, clomped through the Istanbul airport onto the plane. <laughs> with this big cast on my leg. The guy at the airport actually looked at my passport and he asked me, where did you break your leg? I said, uh, down in Izmir. He said, oh, where's the doctor's note? Uh, the doctor's note? Luckily, I'm a good bullshitter and I kind of bullshitted my way. I said, do I have to go all the way back to Izmir with this broken leg to get another doctor's note? And he looked at me and he looked at the long line and he said, go ahead. So I went through and got on the plane where this lovely stewardess reseated me so I could stretch out my, my cast and then got to New York and clomped through the New York airport up to customs. While I was approaching customs, back then in New York, you could stand up top and, and watch people going through customs. It was like glassed in space. My two friends who had financed the trip, as I'm clomping through the airport, I look up and I see them up in the glass screaming and yelling because they know I'm back. And I also look down and I've got this trail of little white flakes behind me. And my cast was crumbling on beneath me as I approached New York Customs. And they just stamped my passport, waved me through, and I made it. That was my first successful hash trip. Okay, so and how much, that, what was that worth on the street then? It was about $5,000 worth of hash. I bought it for like $200 mm -hmm. per kilo. And so, I could sell it for about 5,000, which seemed like an immense fortune to me at sure. 21. So you, so, you, so you went back uh, three times and you got busted on the fourth time, right? So they kind of, why do you think you got popped that time? I know why, because the PLO had just blown up some hijacked jets out in the Jordanian desert and airport security worldwide went on alert. This is the beginning of all of the airport security. Before that, nobody searched to get on an airplane. And um, that's, I... I looked, so I went out to the airport the day before figuring, let me check the, the, what everything's like. And I watched people going through customs and nobody got searched at customs. And I, I was actually going to go up onto the observation deck and watch these people actually get on the plane, which was part of my plan, which is what I should have done. Except I had met this English girl who was studying belly dancing every day and she would love to show me her latest moves. So I ended up going back. I knew this is fine. And I went back to meet the belly dancing girl instead of going up on the observation deck and seeing what I did see the next day, which is they were taking all the people to the airport and putting them on buses and taking them out to the plane, which was cordoned off by a big rope. And they had a, a, a brown table in front of the boarding ramp with policemen on both sides and soldiers surrounding the plane with guns. They were searching everybody right at the airplane. And I see that as I look out the window of the bus, they're going to search people. I can't get back to the airport. I can't 
wrap the shit all, all around my body. I just had to bluff my way onto the plane, which I almost did. I, I went past the first cop, sidling past him. I was put, taking stuff out of my, my shoulder pack and putting it back in as I went past the first cop. And I kind of sidled past the second cop. And he, he looked at me and I said, oh, yeah, th this guy searched me. So I'm putting the book back into my bag and leaning my, my foot up towards the boarding ramp to get onto the plane when this hand grabbed my elbow. And this cop just happened to look back in the first cop because there's two of them at the table had caught his eye and my cop nodded at me like, did you search this guy? And the first cop shook his head, no. And the grip on my elbow tightened. And this cop pulled me aside and said, you know, raise your arms to search me, which I did. He actually hit, I had plaques of hash under my arms, around my waist, on my back, down in my boots. I'm a real skinny guy. I didn't even look very fat with the stuff on. He hit the hard plaques under my arms and he kept going. And then he hit the hard plaques taped to my stomach and he kept going down my legs. I find myself praying, please, Jesus, get me out of here. I'll never do this shit again. But he came back up and he hit the hard plaques. And in his mind's eye, they're out there looking for terrorists. This is, this is bombs. This is explosives. And he, he freaked out. He jumped back and pulled his gun and started screaming. And all the guards put their rifles down and people fell on the ground. And I, I stood there frozen and he stuck the, the, the shaking gun into my stomach. And he, he slowly lifted up my sweater. And it took him a moment to realize that it's not wired plastic explosive is just some idiot out here smuggling hashish, which for him was such a relief. He pulled the gun out. He told everybody it was hashish, it's hashish. And all the soldiers were relieved and they put their guns down. The people got up off the ground. I wasn't so relieved because it was the beginning of a very long five years of prison. So you, uh, you got, uh, how did you get your legal um, representation there? And what happened, uh, short form of this, please. Um, when you went from a four-year term to uh, more of a life, 30-year slash life term, what happened there for the, in legally, the legal system? The American, le legally, the American Council sent out a couple of potential lawyers, and I ended up going through several of them, actually, in my five years while I was there. But originally, I received a four-year, two-month sentence, which with time off of good behavior still left me about two more years of prison, which felt like forever for me. And I was still trying to escape. I was constantly agitated, wanting to get out and trying everything else until my friend died in trying to get me out in one of the attempts. And that pretty much devastated me. It was the lowest point in my, maybe my life. Um, but what I realized is I need to stop trying to get out and not bringing these other people in. And my friend's dead now because of me. I, I, my, own, my own life is messed up. My family is suffering every day. I just need to stop and breathe and do my yoga and do the next two years of prison and learn my lesson and serve my time. And prison became a different place for me. I mean, truly, what, what, what happened, Billy, when um, uh, how did your sentence then get expanded from four years and time off for good behavior? Was this because of all your escape attempts? They kept laying no. around more time. Why no, did they, no. why did I your never sentence got, change? I never got caught in any of the escape attempts. I went to Bakiko, the madhouse to try and get out, but I didn't get the madhouse the so, report. So how did your, and how did your sentence be? Because Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon started the war on drugs and continued the war on drugs and pressured Turkey into increasing their drug penalties. And what they did was chose people like me, idiots like me and other Americans, not the big drug dealers. I got two kilos under my arm. The big guys, they pay, pay their well like everywhere else. But Turkey wanted to show they're enforcing this. So several Americans, starting with me, had their sentences realized. And I went from a four year, two month sentence to a life sentence. I was actually, I was, I had a calendar. I was scratching off the days, 56, 55, 54 days prior to going free. I'm out in my mind. I'm already gone. I'm home. The American Council came and told me that the high court in Ankara rejected the original sentence from my Istanbul judge. And now I'm going to be retried and I will be sentenced to life in prison, <laughs> which kind of turned the escape switch back on and it took me another 18 more months to get transferred to an island prison where I knew I'd have a better chance to escape because I'm a swimmer, I'm a lifeguard, and I just needed to get out of this locked up Samajalar jail. 
And eventually, actually on October 2nd, uh, I was busted on October 7th, 1970, and October 2nd, 1975, just prior to my fifth anniversary, I was desperate men do desperate Desperate okay, things. Well, let's the, hold, hold that thought. Let's get to the escape in a moment. I want to talk a little bit. My special guest is Billy Hayes, Midnight Express fame. And we're talking about uh, his experience. And also we're going to get into his latest book, Midnight Express Epilogue, Train Keeps Rolling. So you're in prison. They extend your sentence, which must have been psychologically devastating to you and your family. And um, one note I want to mention is very important is as, as you were being busted, you had actually a book on yoga that you shoved into your bag somehow and that changed your life because you've been practicing yoga every day since then and kind of kept you i would say from the sounds of it and from what i've read maybe it helped keep you alive because you're you're pretty wired type guy and um i think that probably helped you um and i say this in a positive way probably helped get you on an even keel there is that is that the case billy very much so well first off i'm a new yorker you're from the east coast we got that energy to start with. right right and I was young and i was average and i had all this stuff going on and i was always healthy and an athlete and all and then i got <clears throat> forced into a place where in prison you have no control over anything except yourself and yoga gives you the tools to help learn about dealing with yourself and putting some perspective on things and your body affects your mind and your mind affects your breathing and et cetera, et cetera. And I had just gotten into yoga before getting arrested. I, I had light on yoga. I, I Iyengar's famous book. That's the one I had in my backpack while I was being arrested. And I, I started doing it in jail every day and I have uh, not stopped now till like 52 years. And it truly wow. saved my life in prison. Now, the type of yoga you did in your cell, was it more of a, was it like a hatha yoga or was it more breathing oriented or was it more physical or both? Because, you know, there's so many different types of yoga now and things have changed. And a lot of people, a lot of Americans, of course, have gotten into, it becomes this physical taxing thing where the origins of yoga seemed more focused on breath. Well, I, I, I did breathing exercises, pranayamas. I did physical stuff. It was hatha yoga. That's what I learned from. Um, BKS Iyengar, who really brought yoga from the West, from the East to the West in his book, Light on Yoga, his approach to yoga is different than, they're all good, do it, whatever you can do, do it. But he is, a, his approach to teaching, my wife actually became a yoga teacher. So I, I went, I'm not a big joiner and stuff. I, I do things on my own, but I went with her to her classes as she was becoming a teacher. And they have a, it's almost like martial arts. They have a very specific series of, you have to pass these tests to work your way up from a yellow belt to a, to the top of the pyramid. Mr. Iyengar is at the top and, and so on. And she was working as a teacher and I got to see how specific their teaching methods are. A lot of people can do, not everybody can teach. So I learned the specifics from, it slowed me down and it yoga slows me so, down. So how did you, when you were in prison, how did you teach yourself yoga? You just, by had, going, just by using the book and just practicing every day? I, that's the only choices I had. I had the okay. book. I had the need. I had the desire. It was weird because when you're doing yoga, you know, I've got a blanket down. There's no mats. Then I have a blanket and I should have another thing down on the floor. And you're rolling around and you're in weird positions. It's not a good thing to do in jail because there's a whole lot of guys around who right. like they're interested in what you're doing. Luckily for me, you know, I'm not real big. I was young. I was 22, 23 years old, blonde hair, blue eyes, very pretty, not the best qualities to have in jail. But right. luckily, on my first night in jail, I got in a fight with a guy, sort of a prison trustee kind of guy. And one thing led to another. And again, I'm not real big, but I used to be really fast. And I did a bunch of martial arts and shit when I was in college. And one thing led to another and bang, I hit him in the face. He went down, his nose is bleeding. He's screaming for the guards. The guards are rushing in. They're dragging me out. I'm trying to explain, you know, in, in English, which they don't speak, you know. He woke me up, he hit me first. All they know is new guy, first night in a fight. And they have a way of dealing with fights in prison. If you and I have a fight and I'm all bloody, they'll beat you equally bloody. <laughs> if you're all bloody, they'll beat me equally bloody. Like you can't, so you gotta get in, you gotta get out and not have guards catch you. But they came in and dragged me down to the cellar and they have a form of punishment called falaka throughout the Middle East where they wrap, wrap your legs up and they pick your feet up, take your shoes up and they beat your feet with a kind of whippy stick. And it hurts. I mean, it really hurts. And this is a, 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 
I thought they were killing me. Turns out they whipped me, they hit me, they hit my hands, I was screaming and yelling, and then I went back. Um, I thought it was horrific. Turns out it was not a bad beating at all. They okay. didn't break any right. bone. That's how you decide a bad beating in jail. If they break your bones, it's a bad beating. If they break your bones and beat you the next day, it's a really bad beating. They didn't even break my bones. A little more on uh, the day-to-day life in prison. How many guys were in your cell? What was uh, life like? I mean, I've seen the movie. I remember you guys pushing a wheel around and all of that. And we'll get into the movie and how some Good. of the some of it wasn't uh, exactly accurate. But um, what was day-to-day life like in prison in Turkey? First year, we had individual cells, about 12 feet long and a couple of feet wide, a little hole in the floor in the back of your toilet, which I hated being locked in there every night until I lost it. I never appreciate anything until I lose it. And a locked in jail at night when they lock that door in, I just, I hated being in that little cage. But after a while, I realized how nice it is to be in this little cage, locked in, not having to worry about who's out there, who's doing what, and having a little bit of privacy. After the first year, they suddenly moved us all out of this and put us in a barracks-like cell block with like 72 bunk beds. 72 beds, but always 80, 90, 100 guys. So people are always sleeping on the floors or under the deck or in the bunk. Depends upon who you are, whether you get a bed or not, and whether you can keep it or not. That was, what's it, Jean-Paul Sartre, hell is other people. That, what, what that was like. Being what, was it, what, what was your food like? What did, what did you eat? And food, did you lose a lot of weight? Uh, well, I've always weighed the same pretty much my whole life. I never change weight, but, um, they, what they bring you every morning is a, a big loaf of bread. Sometimes it's hot and fresh. Sometimes it's old and cold. It comes through the little hole in the door. These kids come with big blankets and bring them around. It's baked downstairs in the bakery. If you get there in time, otherwise somebody will steal it. About noon, they come around with these big steel pots full of lentils and beans beans 80 guys locked up together and every day they serve beans mm-hmm. and in the evening they come around another steel pot with some kind of a soup concoction or, or a meat thing with kufta if you have to just live on what they serve it's tough then they come around and sell shit prison is this vast captive market two thousand guys <laughs> wanting and outside vendors would come in with big carts and you can buy all sorts of stuff, fruits and vegetables and onions and olives and pistachios if you have money you can you can live well in jail if you don't have money it's really bad and you've got so to how, work how do, you, how do you deal with that billy with money did you have money did you have it was um, i guess dad, if you, did you have some dollars did your parents get you some money how did that all work well i had some money with me when i was busted but not not a lot but my dad took care of it. my dad came to the prison and showed them. my dad brought money in, inside my dad, who's such a proud man, I mean, my dad is straight and all the good connotations, that word. Mm-hmm. He worked at one place and he started at the Metropolitan Life Insurance when he was 17. He worked there for 42 years. You talk about solid, became a manager, all kinds of stuff. But he was a rock for me to know he was out there. <sighs> was If you don't have anybody on the outside, prison is a really bad place. Mm-hmm. And there were guys who had nobody on the outside they could count on. And okay. I knew that he was... Okay. Uh, uh, Horrific situation. So Billy Hayes, my special guest on Guys Guys Radio. I want to get into so much. So forgive me. I don't mean to be uh, shortening up your answers, but we have we have a certain amount of time and I want to get the right information out to our audience. So you're there. Your sentence gets extended. It's devastating. You end up five years. You had a couple of escape tries along the way. And then that fateful you're on an island prison then and your fateful day, early morning, you make it, you make your way, you go for it. Tell us about that. The, it's a prison island. It's 26 kilometers, about 17 miles or so to the mainland. I'm, a, I'm Again, I'm a lifeguard. I'm a surfer. I'm a swimmer. That's not the hard part to me. It's, there's an, uh, there's a, a dock that goes out into the water. They got guards out there with guns. And there's all of these boats, fishing boats. The fishing boats that come from the mainland come to our island to unload their produce. We have a factory there. It's work. It's cheap. But they're not allowed to spend the night there because it's a prison island. Except one day, as I noticed, a big storm out at sea started blowing up. All these boats came in and spent the night in the harbor. And each boat had a little tiny dinghy tied up behind it. There's my first I thought about swimming. 26 kilometers. I've been in jail for that's a long swim. But desperate men do desperate things. But the dinghy was right there. So one night I was waited for the storm. Storm came in the afternoon. We finished all of our work in the canning factory and such. And um, I arranged to be out past nighttime bed check. A bunch of the kapadai, meaning the big time gangster prisoners, 
They would meet down in the uh, accounting shed every night. They'd be drinking Rocky. They'd be smoking joints. They'd be playing cards and dominoes and shit. And all of these guys, but these, these are big time heavies, wealthy guys who they're on the island for a little while. They're, they're expecting to be leaving. And as a tourist, as the only foreigner, I speak good Turkish by now. I made friends with the, the toughest guy, which is what I always do. You try and pick the baddest dude and make friends with him. And then nobody bothered you because you're friends with the bad guy. This bad guy liked me. We made friends. I made him laugh. He asked me about the United States. So I was out past the bed check, which allowed me to, on a stormy night, to go down there and hang around and then tell the guys, you know, I, I feel I feel sick. Oh, have some have some hash. No, like have some Rocky. No, no, thanks. I'm going back to the barracks. And instead of going back to the barracks, I make my way down the cobblestone to the harbor. And I hug out into this hunt, held out into this big uh tomato paste shed. I got down into the bottom of it and I waited for the guards to go by and eventually I made my way out and down to the water and then swimming out past the boats, out past the first couple of boats. I'm worried about the guards at the end of the dock with machine guns, but it's raining and the wind is blowing. These guys don't care. Nobody's, hardly anybody's going to escape from this island because most guys here have lesser sentences. It's one of the reasons I was able to get transferred to this island because okay. my official sentence came down. I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, and forgive me for interrupting, uh, how you were allowed such free uh, reign. You know, in most prisons, you're not allowed to be walking around and partying and everything. And then you were left to like, I'll just go back to my cell now. And that's how you slipped no, away. I, I, I forgot to mention one reason I went to the island prison is called half open, meaning we have we get locked down for the night, but we work during the day. You're okay. wandering around. Island, you're doing produce. I carried Got bags, it. 50 little sacks up and down between the boats and the canning factory. Everybody worked during the day. Got it. So, so you so you slip into the water that night, right? And you <laughs> swim to a dinghy and you try to get it loosened and it doesn't loosen. And finally it breaks off and you start rowing like mad, right? And you're saying, exactly. what, what was that phrase you said to yourself? If they catch they me, catch they me. beat me. I make it, I'm free. Free. They me i beat me make it i'm free and i just rode you know what i i, I would have rode a thousand miles if i had to man like i just knew if i can get away from this island and get to the mainland somewhere i'll just hide i'll get away from how I did you know where you were billy once you were out at oh, sea so you rode away well, and it was dark and stormy hard. night how did you how did you know where you were going there's the hard part. I knew from during the day. I mean, I knew where the island was. I got maps. I know exactly where I am physically. Okay. And I know if I go this way, I need to essentially head straight east off this little island to hit the mainland of Turkey. Otherwise, I'm going to, the current goes from north to south like this. It, it was going to sweep me down towards the Dardanelles. So I need, I knew I need, at first I used the lights of the island. It's a horseshoe shaped island. And I knew if I would lose the lights, it means I've drifted too far left which i don't want to go that way so i would pull harder on the right or my right hand got way more bloody than my left from pulling harder to keep from the current but i knew if i could just keep going and make it to this mainland which by the morning after the while after a while i was just rowing and i was you know i used the lights of the island and then i lost the, the, the mainland of much. turkey billy they wanted to get to the mainland of you turkey mind. and you didn't want to get to these islands why didn't because that was further out at sea well, the island that I was on was 26 miles, uh, 17 miles, 26 kilometers off the coast of Asia Minor. Istanbul is up here. The whole coastline of Asia Minor is over here. That's where the island was. So by the morning, I'd made it to the coastline of Asia Minor, and the, the rowboat hit the sand and clicked up and okay. clicked up again. I looked up, and I realized I, I made it. <laughs> There's only these rocks. It was... So what did you do? I got out, and I pulled the boat up. I probably should have put a hole in the bottom and tried to hide it, but I love this little dinghy. It, it, it made, made me free. I hugged the boat, and then I looked up and saw that the storm was passing and the sun was rising, and I could see the island way off in the distance, and I know the clock is ticking because they're going to know they're going to do morning bed check and know that I'm gone. But guys disappear on the island. They found two guys way off on the other side of the island once they had a big tire, truck tire, and they were trying to put boards on it and use it as a raft. You know, the guards came up, just watched them for a while. It's like, look at these idiots out here. Right. So, they beat now, them up and so, so where do you go? What do you do? Island. What did you do? I make my way from the, the coast down here to a small village 
And then I knew I needed to get up to the bigger town just up the coast. Again, I know this. I got the maps. I've been looking at this shit for years. I know where I'm going. I needed to get to Bursa, the bigger town. So I made my way. I found some old farmers with a Volkswagen van and they, they got produce and onions and shit on the roof. And for like 12 lira, the driver would take me up the coastline to Bursa. I'm packed in this van with four or five of these sweaty uh, peasant farmers. They're all sprinkling little bottles of, uh, of uh, scented water. What, what, on what were you wearing? What, what did you have on? Did you have a prison outfit on or did you just have no, some no. type of old clothes? They, they didn't have any outfits in jail. People okay. wore their own stuff. Okay. I, I had the jeans, I had a, a turtleneck sweater and an old uh, bush jacket that I'd had for the Got whole it. time. And okay. Was, so you're going I up there. So right. what, what happens next? When I, when I made my way to up the coast, the, the, the van took me up to Bursa and I got off in Bursa and I hung around there for a while and I, I got a bus ticket from Bursa to Istanbul because I, I had a friend in prison who owed me a lot. I saved them from a real bad beating one time and this guy owed me. So, and he, he's now working as assistant manager of a little fo- rundown hotel. He speaks great Turkish, he's become a Muslim. I was gonna go to him he was going to hold me out for like a week or two till things blew over. We get some false papers and I skip out of the country. But when I get to the hotel, the, the little hotel manager says, oh, Wolfgang, no, he, he left yesterday for Afghanistan. It's like, oh, no, no, I want to I want to collapse to the ground and cry because that's the end of my escape plan. I want to get to him. He tied me up. So now I'm out wandering the streets wondering. I got I have plan B. I mean, I made a lot of plan. My plan B was always to make my way to the Greek border. Because I know Greeks and Turks, if I can right. get to Greece, okay. they'll never send How, how me far away is that? That's a, a couple of hundred kilometers. It's like a day's drive on a bus. So okay. I ended up going, I got a hotel room and a little funky hotel by the waterfront. And I, I got to in the hotel room and locked my door. And I dyed my hair. I actually out on the streets in Istanbul, I went to a place and got some Sia Ring boy, a black hair dye. So I got this blonde hair, a blonde mustache. So I dyed my hair in the hotel room, dyed my mustache. The hair looked bad. It was all lank and black. The mustache, it looked so phony. It looked like a big chunk of licorice on my upper mm-hmm. lip. I went back out, bought a razor and shaved off my mustache. Now I got this lank black hair and this raw space kind of outlined in black. I was a mess, but I kind of fit in with the crowd. And the next day I went to the bus station and took a bus to Edirne, which is the border town that's on the river between Turkey and Greece. So the bus got me to Edirne. I got out, I went to a local cab stand and I I found some young long haired driver with an old blue Buick. And I told them some uh, bullshit story about camping with some friends of mine south of here along the river, because that's the river to get across. And he said, where did you learn Turkish? I said, uh, I was in prison in Istanbul. He said, hashish? I said, yeah. He said, you want some hashish? I said, no, 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 God, I don't want any hashish. I just need to get to the campground. So we drove south and we went past little villages. Actually, he stopped in one little village where we stopped. He yelled out to some people for directions to the campground. And I see a guy with a newspaper with a full page headline, colors and everything of this muscle bound, I should look that good, muscle bound blonde guy with a big knife in his hand, cutting the rope on a rowboat in a stormy sea. Like that's on the newspaper headline of good ideas. It's like, no, 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 go, go, go. So we kept going, went south, we went south. We got past the last little kind of road, petered out. It became dirt. The kid wouldn't go any further. I said, just a little further. I know my, my the campground's right down here. He drove a little ways to a, I stopped at the edge of a dry cornfield. So I get out of this car. I stood on the front bumper of his car, looking west at this crimson sun setting back behind dark rolling hills. And I I know down there somewhere is the river and the river is my salvation. So I I gave the kid the last of my Turkish money. He actually, I I said, uh, Alas Maladuk, one of the greetings and he returned the greeting. And then he stopped he tried to talk me out of it. I said, I'll find my friends. I know where he is. He said, no, it's dangerous. You don't want to be out here alone at night as a tourist. I said, thank you, but I'll, I'll deal with it. Now you get to the river. What did you do then? You, did you swim uh, across or did you get a oh, yeah. hop on oh, a boat yeah. or what? How far no, across no, no, was it? There were no boats. There were no boats. Right, I didn't so- need a boat. I can, I can swim anywhere. It was a pretty good sized river. The Maritza River flows down from the Bulgarian mountains to the Aegean Sea. All right. On the how other side. Did, how long did it take you to get across? 
Well, partly is getting from where the kid dropped me off in this cornfield and I waited for the sun to go down and made my way up in the hills and there were some Turkish guards and it was, I went past a, a place where they had tanks in the woods. <laughs> I went around them and eventually I got to the river and stopped to breathe a little bit and to kind of re reassess what I'm doing and where I am. And it was one of the uh, most frightening and amazing moments of my life to realize here I am. This is how close I just need to get to the other side of that river. So I went in and I started swimming again. I'm a swimmer. I'm a lifeguard. I, I was worried about noise. So it's kind of like breaststroking, trying not to make too much, but there's river flowing. And then it was like, I don't care about the noise. I can't drown out here. So I was slowly kicking and kicking and going. And and then finally my knee hits a rock and I brace against the current and drag myself up onto the riverbank and collapse on my back, looking up at the stars and this incredible burst of joy bursts out of me. But you know, I'm, I'm across the river now, but the, the river and the Turkey and Greece, the river goes like this, but over the years, the river shifted. So there's been times where like Turkey's here and the river's there and now Turkey's here and the river's here. There used to be a bridge I'd heard from prison scuttlebutt that when you come around this big bend on that bridge, if you jump off, it'll be Greece, not Turkey. And you know, all that kind of stuff that you hear in jail. So, so you, I wasn't sure. But you made it. Was, so you made it. So uh, I made I didn't know that I was in Turkey. I, I mean, I didn't know that I was in Greece. That was my problem. I didn't want to go up to the first guy and have him be a Turkish border guard until I kind of wandered through the woods most of the night. And about 530 in the morning, the sun was just starting to come up and I came out of the woods of this dirt road, which I, I knew I shouldn't be on because they're going to be looking anywhere. But it was so good on my feet because I'd taken my shoes and socks off. I forgot on the other side of the river and buried them thinking I heard dogs. So I buried my socks and shoes and socks thinking for the dogs, smell these shoes and socks. It'll blow your noses out. So now I'm walking barefoot. My feet are all chewed up. I don't care. I'm so close. I'm so close. And about 5.30, I was walking down the road and I knew I should get off the road and some dogs came out barking and I got away from the dogs and up ahead, I could see like a, a tunnel through the trees. And I said, I'm going to go back in the woods, just past that little wooden kiosk suddenly is there and this bayonet slams down in front of my face and this guard yells something. And I realized I, I don't understand him and he yells again and I realized I don't understand him. And I speak good Turkish right now, which means he's speaking Greek, which means I made it. That's what I do. I made it. I'm, Fantastic. I'm, I'm free. So how long did it take from that point, Billy? Um, again, my special guest is Billy Hayes, uh, Midnight Express fame. We're doing kind of a short version of his, his escape, his time in prison, his escape. And how, you, you realize then you're in Greece. How long did it take you to get back to the U.S.? And how did you decide to write your book how long did it take and then what happened from there um the, Fast Greeks, forward. So the Greeks kept me in the woods for 12 days while they figured out what to do with me and then they finally they deported me as being a bad influence upon the youth of Greece which I love it's the same charge against Socrates bad influence mm -hmm. upon the youth of there Greece and eventually they they took me to the border and I got on a plane and flew to Amsterdam where I spent a very interesting two days in Amsterdam. And then I took the plane to New York City. And when I got off at Kennedy Airport, there were a hundred shouting reporters with lights and cameras and people screaming questions. Billy, what's it feel like to be home? I don't know. I just got here. Haven't even seen my mom. And that never stopped. And people are still asking questions. 50 years later, I'm still talking about this. I got home on a Friday. I was on all the TV stations. I wanted to forget jail. I mean, I'm a writer. It's why I went to Marquette. I wanted to get some experience, but I want to forget jail for a while. I don't want to think about jail. But by Monday, I was meeting with literary agents and I ended up with a gentleman named Julian Bach, who I just loved. And uh, he got me working and writing and I, I sent him 15 pages and he said, well, Billy, this is wonderful because we know now we need a professional writer. I said, oh, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist. He said, he turned my, my style the uh, hysterical subjective which is probably still reflected, reflected here in my speech. And he, he brought, I met a couple of writers, some big name guys, most of them douchebags, who said, they'll, they don't need me, they'll write their own thing. One guy, Bill Hoffer, who I quite liked, he reminded me of my wife. He was kind of calm and steady, but never let up. Kind of like my wife, he just forced me to keep work. First thing we did was 
get a tape recorder and have me, I don't know, for about two days, just talk into a tape recorder. And then they, they transcribed it. That's a humbling experience to read what you, yeah. what you say and how you say it, especially when it right, gets so personal. How, how long did the process take then from, to get the book in a saleable shape, publishable? Less than six months because my agent and uh, E.P. Dutton all said, we need this book now. Ah, right. So I okay. didn't have a chance to forget about it. They forced me, forced me, but they made me write it. Bill Hoffer was steady but strong, kept me writing and writing. We did an outline. He outlined everything. We know it starts here. It finishes there. Now we just have to finish the okay. middle. And every day I would send him pages and he would send back. Uh, or We went back Thomas. and forth to New York. And I have everything done except chapter nine, which was the uh, the Madhouse, Bakakoy, which I just okay. couldn't get to. And Bill said, you need to do that chapter. I sat down and I did that in about two hours, hardly any edits, just boom, finally, it just all came out. Okay, so the book comes out, it's an instant bestseller. How quickly did the movie rights uh, get optioned? Before the book was even out, a, a manuscript of the book was found by through some other way to uh, Peter Goober, who was a producer at Columbia, who was just starting out right then. And Peter is quite an amazing guy. He's so smart and he just, he has more energy than I do. He just never stops. And he knew his story, story, story. He said, this story is going to work for us. And then he brought in some writers and he had me meet with um, Oliver Stone. I spent the week in a hotel room with Oliver Stone. Um, interesting experience. I loved him. He had all this incredible energy and he wrote the script. I have problems with the script. Um, obviously it's a great movie. I'm, I'm thrilled that they did the job they did, but there's things in the film that don't represent me or my experience or my book, or I couldn't write about Turkey in Midnight Express, my first book. That was the fourth trip. I'd made three successful trips. I loved Istanbul. I had a Turkish girlfriend. I couldn't write about any of that. I wanted to. My lawyer, when I got home, said, wait, wait, you want to write about your first three trips and then your fourth trip? I said, yes. He said, great. One more question. Are you out of your mind? You can't say that. I said, why not? They can't, they can't prove anything. He said, they don't have to prove anything. The Turkish government is going to ask for your extradition. You're an okay. escaped convict. Let's, uh, let's uh, government say yes let, or no. Let, let's, you can't let's, say three times okay. before you got past the fourth trip. So Oliver Stone was based upon the book and the movie became very anti-Turkish. They had their own attitudes toward the Turkish people and towards my story. And then they made some huge changes. The biggest change is the courtroom speech in the movie where they've got my character cursing out the Turks. You're a nation of pigs. I blanked your sons. I blanked your daughter. Mm -hmm. The whole, and they had me kill a guard. So the whole world has seen me, my character, kill the guard, curse out the, nurse, the right. nation. Of Turkey. The Turks saw that. That's when they issued an Interpol warrant for my arrest. Not when I escaped and not when my first book came out. But when they saw that scene in the movie, the Turkish government okay. asked for me. OK, so now a um, very interesting point is that um, and obviously in movies, they're going to dial up things to make a better story, quote unquote story. And the power story is stronger than just the facts. So, but you had your facts in the book. They had the screenplay that, you know, kind of got off kilter a little bit there or a lot there. And you had the Turkish government after you. But the interesting thing I found is that you then became kind of a quote unquote, kind of an emissary for Turkey, that you have actually a very good relationship with the country. Is that true? Yes, it took quite a while because all, all the people saw was the movie at Cannes, which was spectacular. And the whole world knew about this. And everybody said, we'll never go to Turkey. We hate Turkey. It's like, no, go, don't get arrested. You will not like the jail, I'll tell you that. Now, of course, there's all this political stuff coming down with Erdogan and all that madness. But back then, I love the people, I love the country. All my Armenian friends were so adamant about me, like, don't talk about Turkey, good. I, I understand about what happened with the Holocaust. I understand all that stuff. But for me personally, I, I didn't have to deal with that. I loved Turkey. I loved Istanbul. It was a great city. A young guy, 22, 23 years old in this city was incredible. And I had money in one pocket and hash in the other pocket. And I was freewheeling. None of that's reflected in the film, of course, because it's about the prison. And then Oliver Stone kind of took out his own animus about a lot of things in the courtroom speech, which to this day, people still say, oh my God, you know, we, 
what you, are you still in what, touch with any of these folks from the movie like oliver stone i mean do you still know him or because i know you went on to your own career in hollywood from there and you i, I know everybody knew oliver we had some you know we'd see each other occasionally and stuff and we'd have some interaction but he just wrote a new book and he said some things in his new book I couldn't believe he said what he said because there was no reason for him to do all that. But um, I ended up writing a letter to Variety refuting some of the specific things that Oliver Stone said. Okay. It's pretty silly because he's a smart guy. And the things that he said, if you read my book, you, you realize that con contradicts just what he said. If you read the next page, you see it contradicts what he said. It's okay. like, why make up these rules, these lies, if they can be easily disproven? Okay, looking back, um, again, my special guest, Billy Hayes, we're talking about Midnight Express and his experience, and it's such a cathartic, life-changing experience, and it's, it's too much to get into one show, so maybe we'll, we'll do another one, but looking back, Billy, and you've had an amazing life, and you've built a very good career out of this, what, what do you feel when you look back and say to yourself, wow, look at where I was, look at where I am now, I mean, would you do it again? Was it just, just fate? How do you look at your life and how do you feel about it? Would I do it again? I've had people ask me that, you know, if I could if I avoid putting all that pain onto my parents, I would avoid putting that pain on them. But for me, I don't know, if I didn't smash up against a wall there in Istanbul, if I got away, I'd have smashed up against the wall somewhere else because I wasn't taking responsibility for my actions, for my life. I was just running free, foot loose and fancy free until that stopped me. And prison turned out to be the, the worst and the best thing that ever happened to me. I, I, I learned things I needed to learn inside. Um, I discovered my, my reason for being in jail. I ended up meeting my wife at the Cannes Film Festival when the movie came out and we've been together for like 42 years now. So when I'm hot, I'm really hot. And when I'm not, I'm really not. And I was not hot for a while in the 70s. And then by 75, suddenly I got hot again and life's been sweet. You know, there's all that stuff everybody goes through and there's ups and downs and you want and all that stuff. But um, I'm a happy guy. I'm really lucky to be married to my wife who- Fantastic. Let me, let me ask you this, Billy. Do you ever, after that uh, experience, did you use hash or smoke weed after that? Or was it like, okay, that's enough of that? Or did you just say, okay, I got popped, but I still enjoy it? Um, I basically smoke uh, hash every day. I smoke cannabis virtually every day for the last 50 years. Wow. I don't drink alcohol and I don't smoke cigarettes and I do yoga every day. Okay. Hack Cannabis now has been proven to be uh, something that's good for your health. It's used in ways now that were never imagined. The war on drugs put that down. For 5,000 years, mankind has used cannabis. We had evidence of it until the war on drugs. And all these people that have had their lives destroyed, as we speak, there are thousands of people, hundreds of thousands, still in prison. Okay. Cannabis. Looking back, um, what would be your, because you've had an experience that 99% of the population has not had so, and you got through it and you had to have a lot of guts to get through it, but you created some of your own problems, but you created your own solutions and you were very resourceful. What, what advice would you give young guy yourself and other guys who are out there 21 years old facing a really chaotic, crazy world? What would be your advice? Somebody has been through it all and more. The advice that I always give is if people ask me is uh, start doing yoga, no matter how old you are, it truly will change your life. It changes your day, which changes your life. You live one day at a time. So develop yoga. It, it helps calm you down. It gives you perspective. Every, it keeps you healthy, but it also calms you down and puts some perspective on who you are and where you're going just for this moment or this day or this lifetime. So that's Fantastic. my advice. Fantastic. All right. Billy Hayes, my special guest on Guys Guys Radio today, very chock full of stories and information. I apologize. We didn't have time for more. I just want to get to everything from the beginning all the way up to now. And you did a great job. So thank you, Billy. The name of the book, the new one, Midnight Express Epilogue, Train Keeps Rolling. There's four books from um, about Midnight Express. Billy, where can people find out more about you? Tell us about your website. Go to a billyhays.com, B-I-L-L-Y-H-A-Y-E-S.com. I can barely open my emails, but they've got a website and it's got all of the stuff on it, the information about my books and my theater pieces, et cetera. 
Okay. Thank you so much. Great job. Really fascinating stuff. Again, I apologize. I need to get to so much of your story and there's so much there and you're very passionate about it. And it's totally understandable. So I hope everybody really enjoyed what you had to offer because it's really an amazing story. So thanks for being my guest on Guys Thank Guys Radio, you. Billy. I appreciate it. you got some really good people on. Larry Grabel is an old poker playing friend of mine. Uh, okay. So yeah. Larry yeah. He's too. been on a few times. I consider oh, him yeah. a mentor. He's fantastic. Sure. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you, Billy. Thank you, Robert. If you're enjoying the content and the guests I bring you each and every week to Guys Guys Radio and TV, please subscribe to our channels. Thanks for your support.